In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we trust this time to you, this conversation. Help us deepen an understanding of morality and truth. Help us to live it out in our daily lives. We entrust this time to you as we pray, Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed is our God, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So John Paul II, at this point then, begins to discuss morality in context in Scripture. And he begins with the dialogue between Christ and the rich young man. Um, according to the story, is that Christ is preaching, and had a young man who said, who wants to know how to be saved. So Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Someone came. We're on Article 6. The dialogue of Jesus with the rich young man, related to the ninth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, concerned with useful that for listening once more in a lively and direct way to a moral teacher. In other words, put yourself in the same position of place as the young man and talk to God about the ground. Talk to him what's right, what's wrong, and how to follow him, how to listen to him. As someone came in as a teacher, what good must I do at eternal life? He said to him, Why do you ask about what is good? There's only one who is good. Who should enter into life keep the commandments? He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said to him, Shut up, word, shut up, read all for me, I'll steal. Should not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Also love neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these things, what's the advice to life? Jesus said to him, You should be perfect. Go and sell your possessions and your money to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. And come on me. Then someone came to And the young man, who had his doctor was not named, we can recognize every person, costly or not, approaches Christ the Redeemer of man and questions him about morality. The young man questions not so much about rules, you follow the full meaning of life. This is, in fact, the aspiration of the heart of every human decision and action. The quiet, searching interior prompt that has freedom and motion. This question ultimately appeals to the optional good, which attracts us and beckons us. It's also the ethical call from God, who is the origin and goal of man's life. <clears throat> Precisely this perspective, the Second Vatican Council called for new and moral theology. It says, teach it with a split of God's vocation to the faith of receiving Christ. The only response to the people satisfying the God of the God. In order to make the encounter with Christ possible, God builds church. If the church wishes to serve the single out, each person may be by Christ, or that Christ may walk each person in the path of life. So, a couple things. This title, teacher, in Hebrew, the little word is just teacher. Now, um, what's the title of teacher in Hebrew? The I N in Hebrew makes this personal, makes it mine. So you have to keep an I N in something that actually is mine. Teacher. Hmm. And this one's a title. Not just teacher, it's not just abstract. But it's my teacher, you're my teacher. Whenever you hear someone call him a rabbi, what they're saying, all the is you're the one that teaches me. 
There's a relation between us. There is something in the note. There's something I recognize in the note. You can come and teach me and show me how to follow the law. And so when the rich young man comes to our Lord, that's what he comes to saying, you're a teacher. He's saying, you're someone who I want to follow, you're someone I wish you with, you're somebody who I want to know. You're someone who has wisdom to teach me, you can show me the right thing. And, like possession. Like possession, yes. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. You said possession, I got that episode. Not the possessive as an owner. Yes. Yeah. Yes, ownership. Yes. Sorry. I, I went the wrong direction with that question. But yes, ownership. My teacher. If you're my teacher, I am your student. I'm your disciple. I'm your father. And Christ responds, it's what we're speaking to how does Christ respond to this request? What does it mean to be a eternal life? How do I, how, how, how do I say? What should I do? What's Christ's response? Before that, he says, he asks him a question. Why do you call me? Why do I call me? Why do I speak about what he said? And only one is there. Right. Only one. And then he answers. What Christ is not saying is, I have the answer, sorry, ask God. What is Christ saying? Christ is saying, the reason why you're drawn to ask me, the reason why you're coming to ask me these questions is because of the fact of who I am. Why do you ask me about what's good? Because I am God. Otherwise. He's an answer. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. He's a your sake. So, these ideas are, are not being distinct, I mean, we think we separate them, they're almost almost like three different events. But they're, they're, they're connected very intimately in the words, the meaning, and Christ is answered very deliberately in this And the reason why I can answer and describe this form, the reason why I can tell us how to go to heaven, and tell us how to live the right way, is because of the fact that who he is. He's not. Now, John Paul II, talking about this, said, but what's being asked about is not simply good and bad, right and wrong, but a meaning life. In other words, we can mention our minds. The moral life, right and wrong, choices, these are all the same things, these different, different emphasis. All it has to do with a meaning of life. In other words, we discuss law, we discuss rules, we discuss right and wrong, commandments. If we discuss them correctly, look at them correctly, it's going to bring us back to life's meaning. Why, why we exist, why we're here, where we're here. If we don't put in the context of what is the meaning of my life, why do I exist? What would make us happy? What am I here for? What's my true freedom? None of these questions would be answered the right way. See, Christ, in his invitation and showing him how to live correctly, is that there. The invitation was on to say, come and follow me. In order to live life correctly, in order to live life correctly, it's only found in following Christ and make him truly be my teacher. It's not simply there are these rules. And then the name of God is following the rule, the end of the following the person. That doesn't mean we're going to fulfill the rules, but keep certain rules, we live a certain way. But when I'm, I'm a disciple of a person, a particular person, it is Christ. I'm following the Lord. Well, he can give me any love. It's an appeal, John Paul II says, it's the other way, it's a seeking. Not just any good, but the ultimate. Why do you call me good or the one is good? What's the ultimate good in our life? Then it's going to be God's son. What we're seeking in the end is not just any kind of good, any kind of good thing, but it's going to be the goodness of God. 
And who is it who comes to us and says, for us and show us God's goodness? Jesus. And so he comes in human flesh, he's in the human words, the human face, to bring us into that goodness, to bring us back to the line. Then Daniel the second kind of had this appeal. He said, "This is why the new moral theology is back, back to vocation, our calling, our creation, the reason we exist, why we're made, what God has made us for in the first place." See if you don't look at the vocation. This is what this is what moral theology is. It's not simply a study of. Some abstract principles, not simply this, you know, a study of you know, don't do the wrong thing, or here's how you avoid getting into trouble. Our vocations are good, it's an account of Christ. That's moral theology. And if we, we, we separate that from the context of the rest of our life or from Christ Himself, we're going to misunderstand what we're doing, is what moral theology actually is. And so, as normal thing is, 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 is appealing to us, because all of these people who address and answer, all of them are trying to do this. If I separate moral theology from Christ, separate moral theology from, from being Catholic, separate moral theology from Jew, Jew, and like that, make a bunch of rules. But John II is saying, this is your vocation to being a man. See, this is a bunch of rules. Rules change depending on the context. You need to charge. The speed limit, that's a rule. Now, there's a bare context to it by the fall. But the fall of was that it was an arbitrary limit for no reason whatsoever. It might change depending on who the board governor was or who got arrived or when, in fact, the police up man out there or an ambulance it does change. It's the context. But all of those things are done to point us back to higher purposes, right? The reason why this building is there is to preserve life, to have an order where we're driving, so we don't crash for example, we're shot. The reason why the police speed, the ambulance speed, is not to oppose that, but to upkeep that, is to keep preserving of life. And so it's all for the same reason. There's different ways to get to the same place because the speed limit itself, 30 miles an hour, or 50 or 60 or 10, that's not the point. The point is what's the change. The preservation and the respect of the life. And so all the people, you know, all the people who are pluralist, who are relativist, all the people who looked at last time, they missed this part, they brought this part. Now John Paul II begins with this biblical passage, he wants us to think about moral theology, and there's complicated rules, and there's this principle, that principle. It goes back to this. We're connecting people back to Christ and salvation and no meeting God himself. When we do so, don't want to say it says to the church, we Christ, we the church. That's all that ends up with an encounter with my teacher. All right. Article 8. Teacher, what could us do to have eternal life? For my teacher, because I do. The question of rich young man, put this to Jesus of Nazareth, is what which rises from the depths of the thought. It's an essential and an oil question of the life of every man. It's about the world that must be done and the eternal life. The young man senses that there is a connection between moral good and the fulfillment of his own destiny. He's about Israel, raised the world, shattered the law of the Lord. If he actually is this question, it's not, you pursue it's not because he's ignorant of the answer of the law. <laughs> So more likely, the, the attractiveness of the person who is Christ to prompt the new questions about moral good. He feels the need to draw near to one of the new preaching with the new decisive proclamation. The time is fulfilled with him by the pent, the pent and believe in the good news. People today also need to turn to Christ once again, 
order to receive from the him the applicant principle of what is good and what is evil. Christ is the teacher of the one who has life in himself. is always present in the church and the world. As he opens up the faithful the book of the scriptures and fully revealing that the Father's will teach the truth about all action. At the source and some of the common salvation we got to be in the history. Christ has life to come down condition and technical vocation. Consequently, the man who wishes to understand himself thoroughly, or just in accordance with immediate partial or superficial illusory standards of actually the deity. As with this unrest, the certainty and even his weakness and sinfulness, there's life and death in Christ. He must, so to speak, enter him with all his own self. He must appropriate and assimilate the whole of reality, the creation, redemption, or by himself. This profound process takes place with him and bears fruit only in the race of God, but also the people under himself. Teaching rests profound and unchanging content. We must carefully find the meaning of the question asked by the rich young man in the gospel. Even more than me, it is supplied, ask allowing ourselves to be guided by it. Jesus is a patient and tends to teach or answer the young man, taking him as a word by the hand, even if step by step, full truth. What John Paul II is saying is. Man was made for God. The end are made for God. What it means that is in the heart of every one of us, even those who hate God or who are atheists or reject God, there are questions about why we're here. You want to be good people. Even the worst criminals deep down want to be good people. Now they want less than other things. But we, even people who are these horrible lives, wish they could be good. Want to be good. Nobody deep down wants to be bad. Or bad anyway. Nobody really wants to be bad. Because we're not made for that. We're made, no, we're made for God. We're made for life. We're made, made for heaven. And knowing that, there arise questions. And more than that, once we have met God, talked with God, spoken to God, We'll have deeper questions and greater questions that arise in our hearts. Deep things will rise and come out. Only Christ had these questions. And what the second says is that we come to God then broken. We come to God in the end, we come to God not because we have all the answers, but because we don't. And see, if we come to moral theology, we come to study God, and say, well, how do I get to heaven? Thinking of all the answers, thinking that I already have all the replies, thinking that everything's already said. Who was the teacher? Who wrote the Lord and said, Lord, gradually I made it, Lord, gradually I made it, Lord, I'm doing it, gradually we come to our Lord and say, Lord, show me the way. If we don't, we're not really asking him anything. We're not letting him lead us. And so, we live in a world that is so busy. It is so noisy. It is so entertained. You plug in your ears to these questions. You try to distract us from this, but you're trying to tell us to see these questions, all these questions. As long as we have a full belly and something to watch, something to do, we can distract ourselves from having to face these questions. And John Paul II said, there's a reason that our brokenness God reaches us. He wants us to ask this question. He wants us to feel this way. He wants us to recognize our need. So we look. But otherwise, we'll be stuck in trap where we are. Where we are is not going to lead to eternal life and happiness. And so we come into our book. Article 9. 
There is only one who is good. Jesus says, Why do you ask about what is good? There is only one who is good in which to enter the light and the commandments. In the version of the evangelists, Mark and Luke, the question is phrased in this way Why do you call me good? No one is good without law. For answering this question, Jesus wishes the young man had the clarity of why he asked the question. The good teacher points out to all of us that the answer to the question, What good must do to have eternal life? who had only a turn in one's mind, part of the one who was good. No one is good without law. Only God can answer the question of what is good because he is good himself. To ask about good, in fact, ultimately means to turn toward God and his goodness. Jesus shows the young man's question in a really a religious question. That goodness that attracts the same God and light as them, that source of God. He is God himself. God alone is worthy of being loved by one's heart, by one's soul, by one's mind. He's the source of man's happiness. Jesus brings the question about morally good action back to his foundation, the knowledge of God, from his goodness, fullness of life, and finally from activity to the happiness. In our modern world, we have the false idea that it can be good without God. Right here all the time. You know, here she's a good person, yeah, they're going to church, yeah, they're. Build the light. Start to be. We have this idea in our hearts and minds, our culture, that we can be good without God. That God is a nice addition to the goodness, but has nothing to do with being good. That one can be upright, be moral, be be build the light. Be good. And God's not necessary. And what Christ points out, what Heaven points out, is ultimately because every one of us has a vocation and a foundation in God. A meaning in life, ultimate good, ultimately, any kind of moral choice, any kind of moral sin, any kind of right and wrong comes from God. Why are things right and wrong? Why are things good and bad? Well, things are right and bad, right and wrong because they harm us or help us. And they bring us to God. Well, if God isn't there and relevant, what is the source of right and wrong good matter? You, you leave it without any foundation. This is why you have cultures you know, who will the one time claim to respect human freedom, but will also at the same time you know, say that you know, human choices are arbitrary as long as we vote on certain things. And so we live in a world that Human life has always mattered as long as people agree it doesn't matter. The unborn, the elderly. Because we've separated, we've separated goodness from God. We've separated goodness from truth, who is also God. Separated goodness from our vocation as human beings, which is also God. And so to live a morally good life without having God as your foundation is impossible. Now, one can certainly do one's best because it's written in one's heart. Um, one can certainly, um, if one lives in a culture that has it understood, you know, if you live in a, in a Christian culture, if you live in a Catholic culture, yet the angels on the street fall off the cultural norms of living a good life. But we live in a society in a world more and more separate from God, parts from God and rejects God. We see more and more drifting toward the world's long ago. And as a result, what happens to us, we're miserable. You can't be happy without being good. That's what John Zayn says here. Man's happiness and the purpose of our activity as resides in God. So that's what we're made for in the first place. But sin makes us miserable. Have you ever met somebody who's living in sin, trapped in sin, who was really happy? I have. 
Now, see people are entertained or distracted or having fun, sort of, it's for a short time. But they're lonely and, and they're, they're angry and they're hurting. And they only admit to themselves. You can't be good without God. And so to have a, a moral understanding, to have a, a moral life, to look at what's right and wrong, especially as Catholics, you have to be unafraid or ashamed to say, as a religious question, you can't separate God from this question. When being a person, you have to be a follower of God. Article 10. The church, instructed by the teacher's words, believes that man made the image of the Creator, revealed by the love of Christ, made holy by the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, made by the Creator, revealed by the Christ, and the presence of the Spirit. That's all the purpose of his life, live for the praise of God's glory. So that each of his actions reflect the splendor of that glory. Know that a beautiful soul, you are the image of God, writes an animal. Know that you are the glory of God. Hear how you are his glory. The prophet says, your knowledge has become too wonderful for me. This to say, my work, in my work, majesty has become more wonderful. The counsels of man is exalted. I consider myself as I am known to you in my secret thought and the most of mystery and knowledge is close to me. Know that a man of greatness and vision. What man can be something actually? If the purpose of my life is going to happen, how can I expect my actions are aimed for that goal to lead me there? That makes no sense, right? If, if, if my goal is to get a show, any steps I take off any would show is the wrong direction. And I can't say, oh, I'm going to head to Holbrook, but my, my goal is to get a show. And the further I go this way, the further I have to show. And so people will say, yes, well, I, I know that, that my goal is God in heaven, but I'm going to live this, my, my actions in, in, in this part of my life, I'm going to leave it that way. Away from them. They're my own, whether, it's, whether it's marriage, whether it's, you know, entertainment, whether it's food and life. My actions have to reflect my destiny. I'm not going the right direction. If what I'm doing and acting, the way I'm living isn't going the right direction with God, I'm not going with God, I'm not living for my other purpose. When God created us, that's what Edward was saying in a different way. When God created us, God created literally left the world finish. Not because he was weak or lazy or couldn't create the world, because he said, I want you to help me. I want you as my children to work with me to help me create the world by your choices, by your actions, what you do, who you are. And so everything we do, every, every action we make, every choice we make, we're helping to create ourselves, all around us, and in other. Helping to form each other for ourselves and the world around us better or worse. What this means then, as Amber says, is that going back to the moral life and the moral choices, regardless of who's answering this question, people are trying to separate my moral life from I'm a good person, not right or wrong, from God. By saying everything you do belongs to God. But it's not hate for God, but live for God, but not under God's heart, God's command, God's rule, and doing the right thing. Going the wrong way. What man is, what he must do, becomes clear as soon as God reveals himself. The Decalogue is based on these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of Baal. In the ten words of the cup, Decalogue is, means ten words, from a commandment. Uh, in Hebrew, we don't see the word commandment, it's usually we say ten words. Same from the seven last words of Christ. 
the ten words that cover Israel and the whole wall, but makes himself known and acknowledged the one who the most good. For the despite man the sinner remains the model of all action. And of course, this command should be holy and right where you are born. But the one who faithfully loves the man gives him his law, or to restore man's original peace of harmony with the creator of all creation. And what is more to offer is divine love. I walk among you and I will be your people, whether your God should be my people. The model of what's right and wrong is not simply a rule, it's God. And the purpose of these laws and commandments is to make us like God, help us to follow them, to perform a life with Him, and to make our actions, our hearts, conform back to Him. The draws of the Christ start with Christ's law. The people will separate, or only separate, morality from following God. But they'll say, they'll try to separate morality and love. They'll say, well, that's what the law said. I'm going to be pastoral. I'm going to be loving. I'm going to be kind. That's what the law says. But I'm going to be nice to them. I'm going to be a good pastor. I'm going to be different way to do things. Everybody's like, right? This, this is not familiar to you. <laughs> But they separate these things in their hearts and their minds. But you cannot be truly pastoral and probably the people toward God. If you're leading people toward God, where are you leading them? Away from God. Is that kind in the end? If a doctor were to tell you that you were dying of cancer, the doctor said, I'm going to scan this person. And I have medicine that's going to be really painful and hard work. So I'm not going to get it done. I'm going to tell everything that's great. That may be a doctor. No, we a terrible doctor. But I'm being so nice, I'm being so kind. Well, you're not, you're being a jerk. You're being a coward. It's not nice or kind to make people sick. And we live in a world of the culture which convinces people, well, just be nice. Well, don't speak up, don't say anything, because the people might not be hurt or upset or have to do hard work. It's not loving, it's not kind, it's not good. Is to keep people from truth or from the head. Law and love, law and truth, law and God, these are not separate things. They're different aspects of the same reality, different parts, but we can't separate them. We can't draw the heart from truth. Because it's already happening to back to location, back to meaning of why we're here. So we're talking about the second beginning of this discussion and the back to Christ, the heaven of God. The moral life in and of itself is the response to the many gratuitous initiatives, the free and the kind, taken by God and love man. It's a response of love and to love, according to the statement made in Deuteronomy by the fundamental man. Here is the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You should love the Lord God with your heart, with your soul, and your strength. And these words, if I command you this day to be upon your heart, I'll teach them to your children and listen. Thus, the moral life of the, the, the gratuitous of the freedom of the, the, the free kindness of God's love is called to reflect its glory. For the one who loves God is not to be pleasing to the one who loves. The way to love words we sought and love itself. Charity, in fact, is of God's way to God himself is charity. And so living the right way, living a moral life, living a good life, isn't simply I don't want to be caught, I don't want to go to hell, or nice things. Ultimately, it should be a response of love. God is being inspired by God, so I'm going to do the right thing. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is fear of the Lord. That's this. I love God, God loves me, so I don't want to hurt him back. It's not the fear of God that stands in the eye of him, it's fear of God that will hurt him. I'm afraid of offending him. Because I'm close to him, I want to be, be drawn, drawn into his heart. The Last Supper, what does Christ say about if you love, if you love me, you'll walk? Keep my commandments. Right? This moral life, this moral law, is, is simply again, it, it, it's loving God, it's following the Lord, it's being most. 
And there's something in your, your heart and your mind that you can love God or be good without God or working. I don't think these things are possible. The moral life and moral law is simply, you know, an abstract thing or following the rule. It's love, it's goodness, it's happiness. The statement that there is only one who is good has brings us back to the first tablet of the commandments, which calls us to acknowledge that God is the one Lord of all who worship and love and in holiness. It is belonging to God, the good is to belong to God, to obey God, or come to him and do justice and love and kindness. The knowledge of the Lord is God is the very core, the heart of it, from which the particular precepts flow toward which they are ordered. The morality of the commandments is the fact that the people of Israel belong to the Lord and made heaven, because God alone is the one who is ruling. Such witnesses of sacred scripture, and we need every one of his pages about the perception of God in after holiness. Holy, 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 Lord of hosts. But if God alone is the good, even in that verse, right, the most rigorous observance of the commandments, is either the law, it is in all of the Lord is God. Men are in the world worship, worship the law. So Philip can only come from a gift of God. The author of a shared divine goodness revealed and medicated the of Jesus, the one that man Christ in these words is the teacher. But the young man that perhaps only perceives that in the end he was fully revealed by Jesus Christ in invitation can't follow me. There's a traditional image, a description of him matters. If you notice a lot of the images that Moses on the mountain, he's holding two tablets, two stone tablets. Right? The, the, the scripture uses the plural, and so it's at least two, and so traditionally there were two tablets. Traditionally, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first three commandments, one, two, three, have to do with God. And the next seven have to do with the name of another human being. And so traditionally, this was the first tablet of the law. This was the second tablet of the law. As you can see, the church fathers or saints or people will refer to them as the first and second tablet. And there's origin. These belong to each other, are related to each other. Indeed, if you understood this perfectly, this first commandment, God would follow that alone, you're going to follow the rest of them automatically. Um, so these belong to each other and kind of relate to each other. When John Paul II is talking about the first tablet being necessary, the first tablet being relational, what he means is our relationship with God. This is the first time. How do I relate to God? How do I follow Him? What is that relationship for? And if I want the right relationship, it's going to be following those commandments. And then he goes on and he points out the gospel and he says, The young man wants to fulfill the law. He wants to say, How do I earn heaven? At what point does that? What's the answer? Once you're in heaven. Once you're in heaven. How do I get there? Is it going to be because I get cut up commandments? If I keep enough commandments, then I go to heaven automatically? Is that in the work? Well, Christ, the two saviors, right? So it goes back to the only one who goes to heaven. And yes, love God to do those things doesn't keep the commandments. I'm out there because of the commandments. It's like those of you who have had children or seen children, uh, you know, mom promises, you know, the kids dessert that they eat their peas. They're broccoli. That's Does eating broccoli or peas have anything to do with dessert in and of itself? No. Right? There's, there's no. There's no natural law, there's, there's no there's nothing in nature or physics or science which means we get to get ice cream, nothing, nothing like that. 
But once mom has said that promise, now all of a sudden there's a justice now that comes into their the obligation of the industry if they do those things. But it does come from the end of the gift of mom. Right? In a similar way, keeping these commandments by the bread itself aren't going to bring us to heaven. They're good to do anyway. Like eating peas and your vegetables is good for us, it's healthy. Don't eat our vegetables and your peas when you're sick. I don't eat the right way, we're going to make you sick. That's what we're treating the man. It's good for you. But I said so. It's all things we sick. That's good for us. It's still good. We just want it. But in addition to the other good things that happen to you, have to understand it's good for you, I'm going to give you something good as well. And so God, in His goodness, has said, live in this way, it's good for you, even if there's no heaven. Even if at the end there, there was no heaven whatsoever, now there's no good for you. Even if, if, if this life is all we have, living this way, following God, loving God, loving your neighbor, would be a better way to live, not to love God, but maybe. But in addition to this, God then draws us and his love for us into eternal life. And he does not just simply, from the outside, comes man and dies for us, and walks with us, and brings us to hell. And to fulfill the law is impossible. But to share in, in that fulfillment, to share in that, the gift of God, that's what we want. There's always been more laws to keep, because I'm alive. In terms of I'm alive, more laws to keep. Every second of my life, there's nothing more to keep. It's not the point of my life. And so this law is a necessary foundation of everything. This law is pointing back to God, not to relate to God, but God is doing this more for And the text is using this to I'm going to bring you then with my gift to myself. But this is the point. This is what gets us to heaven. It's necessary. By all these things, I can't go to heaven because I'm rejecting God. So I, I can break my relationship with God, but I can't. It's to feel it for myself to heaven by myself. Difference makes sense? To buy myself. I can die, but my child can't live. I am intelligent enough, smart enough, wise enough to destroy this church. I can't build it. But we can destroy it. By myself, I can die. Stop eating, bullet in my brain, poison, no air. But I can't make myself live. I gotta give myself one. But if not, not live this way I die, then only God Himself can bring me life. And I receive that for sure of Jesus Christ, the gift of Jesus Christ. And so the moral life points us toward, leads us toward it, but there is in the end something deeper, more and greater, because of the goodness and the gift and the love of God. Make sense? Questions, comments? Number 12. Only God can answer the question about the good because He is the good. But God has already given the answer to this question. He is by creating man and ordering him with the wisdom and love to his final end. And then the law is written in this form. So we have a natural on our this natural law is nothing other than the light of understanding and accused in us by God. But we understand what's be done and what we avoid. God gave this light this law to man in creation. God did so in the history of Israel, especially in the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words of Sinai, whereby he brought to existence the people of the covenant, and called it to be his own possession among all the peoples, the holy nation. To arrange his own holiness to own peace. The gift of that law was a promise to sign a new covenant, which the law would be written in the new and definitive way from the human form. The place of the law of Aunt Sims was figured on. And though there's a new heart to be given a prayer a new spirit to the Spirit of God. So there's a lot in that text. <laughs> uh, I still won't say it. 
So Adam and Eve didn't have the spirit of God in them the way we do? Not the way we do. Is it because we have a conscience or no? No. Or? Um, it's because of the fact that God became man and now we united. Um, so Adam and Eve had the spirit of God in God the his services because they had sanctified rights. We do have a deep way in the way. Oh, they, um, okay, they lost it for They us. lost that, yes. yes. They lost it. I guess we all lost it. So, all lost it. Yeah. <laughs> and so it did happen. We, we have a deeper source, a better source, mm-hmm. and a deeper relationship. Because if that means hadn't sinned, you wouldn't have this Holy Spirit, we'd have a relationship with God, we would be throughout. Now our relationship is through Christ, who is God Himself. Um, so it, it is the same, the same person, same relationship for certain sense, but deeper and better foundation and, and, and where it comes from is deeper and better. Yeah. Um, John Paul II is pointing out different sources of, of the law. And first they have the natural law. You also have then the law of the old covenant and commandments, all those things. And finally, you have the new covenant. And so, God, in this very beginning of creation, has already told them what to do. Written down our hearts, we know deep down that murder is bad, that stealing is wrong, that adultery is good. It's helpful because we're idiots. We told the right. And that means we, it's also in order to fully and completely in the grace of Christ. And we are. So all of these things aren't, we aren't fighting each other, they're deepening and assisting us to do the this the right way, to walk with the Lord where He wants us. So we have the answer by who we are as human beings. It's given to us directly by God, and then He helps us to live it out by dying on the cross for us. And then there's the Holy Spirit. Consequently, after making the important clarification that only one was good. Jesus tells the young man who should enter into the life of commandments. In this way, the close connection is made between keeping the commandments, these are one. God commandments show man the path of life, they lead to it. The very lips of Jesus Christ and Moses, and once again give the commandments of the decalogue. And so Christ not come and destroy them all, chapter 5. Heaven come to the rid of the law and not come to the middle of it. Jesus himself definitively confirms that and imposes them to us as the way and the condition of salvation. The man turns into a promise. In the old covenant, the, the, the object of the promise was the possession of the land, the people would be able to live in freedom and record the righteousness. In the new covenant, the object of the promise is the kingdom of heaven, the new land, the land of the new promised land. The Jesus declares the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. A sermon contained the fullness, the fullness of complete formulation of the new, the new law. Clearly, the that law entrusted by God to Moses and Mount Sinai. The same reality of the kingdom is, is referred to with the expression of eternal life. It's the sharing of the very life of God. It's taken as perfection, perfection, and the of the life of death. But the faith is even now by the truth, a source of meaning for life. An equate to sharing the full of all the cross. And Jesus says to the disciples, I speak to the rich young man. Everybody who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother, children or wives, for my name's sake, you receive a hundredfold from Harry to our life. So Christ repeats the words of the commandments. But you add something new. If you look at the old Testament, old Testament when Moses is proposing the commandments of the law and, the, and this way of life to the Jewish people, he does not say that they're doing this will lead to heaven. 
He doesn't say in there, doing this will be eternal life. He says, I'll promise to do this, you'll be his people, protect you, guide you, will have long life in this land. We bless you. Jesus adds perfect. He says, do this, and you'll go to heaven. Do this, and you'll be my follower, my disciple, and you'll live the right way. Ten Commandments, there's an expansion, the promise of expansion to what leads us. Now, it's not a little testament that we're going to have, it's not but we're still being a little we're still being shown. Uh, they, they show that believe in heaven, but there are elements of the don't. Even to this day, um, in the, the Sadducees of Christ's time, basically would say, if there's an afterlife, wonderful, if there's not wonderful, either way you go. And that can be either very noble or it can be very quick, depending on the person. But there are people who mean that simply and they trust God and open some of his hands, whatever happens, happens. There are people who therefore will say, who cares what happens? I'm going to, therefore, my, my point of life is to love being powerful. Right? You know, the more money I have on earth, the more God bless me, and the better person I am. We see this, for example, when disciples ask, um, when Christ says, these are rich men to be stood. These are mortality paths of bad meal, the rich men are the same. The disciples are we say, the rich men are blessed by God. The people in the say they're blessed. And Christ is saying, well, there's more of these things to be done. Um, and so what's happening here is even though, so even, even though testament, there were more people, it's not the promise wasn't there, it wasn't believed. But here the promise is made explicit and clear. And Christ is now turning our mind and hearts away from earthly life and into the kingdom of heaven. The old covenant of preparation began with a home and a house, a place, a culture. We could do that. And then from there it expanded to now living that, no matter where you live, not living for this life or for hope here, but for eternal life. And certainly the prophets and, and the great kings and the great saints of the Testament lived that way. I mean, they, they certainly were hoping for eternal life for heaven. Um, but it's not made explicit in the same way it is in the New Testament. Paragraph 13. Jesus answers, I have nothing, young man. When he was asked the teacher of commandments, which was he kept, he said to him, which was? He asked him, was due to life or was to show the honor of God's holiness? He asked, after directing the young man's gaze towards God, he surmised the badness of the death of all of our own name. He told him, of adultery, of God's witness, only for the mother, and they raised herself. Right, so from here, he points to here. Notice the balance he here recounts. Don't refer to God or not. God alone is good, look to God, and I love your neighbor and love God. Why does John Paul II say the young man's asking how to acknowledge God's words and live his life to acknowledge God's words? Why, why, why does he say, I'm going to show my life the commandments my words? Right, so if you're living a good life, you're showing your own holiness, right? Why does God for the second say you live a good life to command as you're showing God's words? Because God gave us the commandments. God gave us the commandments, but the commandments are a reflection of, of who you are. God's commandments. Yeah. Be holy as I am holy. Live this way. Do these things. We do live this way not simply because God is under our rules. But this is a translation on God's own life. That's why it leads to eternal life. Because it is God's holiness living as God lives. And so that's why it's drawn us into these. It's not an arbitrary thing. It's, this is the way God lives and the way God loves. Do these things, you're becoming like God. That's why God tells us to do this. He wants us to become like Himself. So we go from relationship with God to relationship with our neighbor. 
In the context of this conversation, especially for the Paris and Matthew's text with Luke and Mark and saying the parables, it's clear that the Lord does not intend for this each and one of the families required in our life. He's, just, he's not going to focus. He's implying everyone else. You can't say, oh, this is one. Oh, this is a one. <laughs> Rather, wishes to draw them and attention to the centrality of that law of the precept. And as much as the interpretation of the words, I'm Lord of God, and i Nevertheless, we can't go tell the notice which commandments of the law of the Lord, which commands the law of the Lord calls beyond that. They are some of the commandments which belong to the so called second tablet of the Ten Law. The sum of nature of which is the commandment of love neighbor, which love your neighbor as yourself. In this commandment, we find the expression of the same identity of the human person, only creature without one for its own sake. Different commandments of the death law are really only about so many reflections of one commandment about the good of the person. At the level of the many different good, fair wise and entity is spiritual and bodily being worship of God, with his neighbor of the material world. As we read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Ten Commandments are part of God's revelation. At the same time, teach us man's true identity. Which are rightly essential duties to the duties are directed to the rights inherent in nature of the human person. The commandments of which she is reminded the young man are meant to safeguard the good of the human person, the image of God, protecting his goods, those things good for him and his health. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not do this. Our moral rules from the terms of prohibitions. These negative precepts express a particular force and ever urgent in the protection of life. Communion of personal marriage, private property, truthfulness, and people's good today. So, if you come to a book which kind of parses out the different rules, the formulas of the book, the only manuals of morality. There are many of them. Some are very good. Uh, um, there's moral questions and dilemmas and problems that come across that's helpful to have with God. It all goes down to this. All of these discussions, all of these principles, all of these things this comes down to am I living for a God out of love of God out of my name? All of these rules I'm following, all of the reasons why I don't harm other people, I don't steal and cheat, why I keep the tickets of marriage. Comes down to love me and love for God. All of these things which I do, and they be a good moral life, is tied back therefore to God and shows forth love and has for man. Because I love God, I love those whom God loves. And if I harm the people whom God loves, I'm going to offend God. If I were to beat up your children, we be friends. I'm not touching you though, we're friends, right? No, it's a work that How can we offend God and harm his children? Or how can we love God and harm his children? We can't, we can't love God and harm his children at the same time. And so when God goes out for us, this is part of loving God. And part of living like God, doing what God does. We can't be like God and act like God if we don't love like God and care for those who God loves. And so all of the moral rules are down to those basic principles. It's our arbitrary random things. Now we have to parse them out, tease them out, we have to expand on them, we have to discuss them, because we have small brains. That's how for us to be able to put them into, into this little easier bullet or format. So don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Here's how you live your life the right way. It's good for help for us. But in the end, it all comes down to these things. Here's what, here's what it means, here's the foundation. He wants to be in real life, well, don't do these things. No. Don't, 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 don't fight. What about what, 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 All the things you have to spell out you know, for your children, for ourselves, for other people. The commandments that represent the basic conditions of the name, 
At the same time, they have proof of that. So we live this way. I truly love my neighbor. This is also the starting point of my neighbor. But if I don't live this way, I love my neighbor, but live this way and keep it as part of myself, it's proving I love my neighbor. They are the most necessary step of the journey towards freedom, starting point. The beginning of freedom, thus in my best minds, is to be free from crimes. This is adult murder, adultery, fornication, theft, fraud, sacrament, and so forth. But once one is without these crimes, and every person should be without them, one begins to lift one's head towards freedom. This is only the beginning of freedom of birth.
Make our hearts, minds, and voices of the United the cross of your Son. We may serve you here on earth. May we be bread for heaven. We all that we say and do be fearful. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be. World of thy Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, peace. Thanks for coming. Thank you.